Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for coming today. Today we're going to be talking about backport or upgrade decisions and unchaining OpenStack releases. And uh, please hold your questions till the end. We'll have about five or ten minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. For those of you who had been looking at the schedule, Chenmai Naik was supposed to be presenting with us, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today. Um, and, but he was very instrumental in coming up with the slides and the ideas that we're going to present. So I am Brad Picorni. I'm a principal software engineer with Symantec. And I primarily work on Horizon, but also work on some of the other OpenStack components. And this is my uh, colleague, Bed Vlad. Hi, everyone. I'm Bed. I'm also a principal software engineer at Symantec, and I work primarily on the platform as a service solutions. But I've also worked on Keystone, Nova, and Horizon in the past, and I'll be doing the first half of our presentation today. Here's our agenda. I'm first going to talk about keeping up with OpenStack releases and how at Symantec our approach in doing so has evolved over time. Then I'll describe some keystone use cases and how we went about solving them through upgrades. Brad, Brad will then cover some interesting Nova and Horizon use cases. And finally, he'll recap our lessons learned. Keeping up with OpenStack can sometimes feel like running on a treadmill that's going at 100 miles per hour, especially if your organization plans to upgrade every time there's a new release which is six months in OpenStack's case. Add to that the fact that bug fixes and stability support are only available for two releases, two releases behind the latest, and things can feel a bit crazy. Now, when we first started out our cloud at Symantec, we were aware of these facts, but we weren't quite aware of the cost of the upgrade itself. So let me walk you through the story of our cloud to get a better idea of what I'm talking about. It all started with a big bang in the summer of 2014 when we deployed our first Havana production cluster in one of our data centers. The edge here in the diagram stands for Havana. At that time, even though there was a newer release of OpenStack, which was, which is ICE, which was ICE House at that time, we decided to stick with Havana because we thought it would just be more stable. And as you, can, as you see there, we didn't have a horizon back then because we wanted our customers who are internal semantic business units and developers to work with just the APIs and CLIs, CLI clients. But we later realized that that wasn't such a good idea. But going forward from here, we had two main options. Either we fork the Havana code base and maintain our own repo with our own features and our own bug fixes, or we sync up with the community code base by up upgrading frequently to keep up, and by keeping our custom code changes to a minimum and keeping them portable. We went with the latter option because uh, we wanted to get newer bug fixes and features automatically with each upgrade. We also decided to stay two releases behind the latest or two releases behind trunk for stability reasons. So this meant upgrading every six months whenever there was a new release. And this happened usually the time of every OpenStack summit. And in our case, it was just six months after we went live. So six months passed by, and it was time to upgrade every single service to IceHouse. Uh, so the way we went about this was uh, we had, from our team, one software engineer assigned to each service with the task of developing an upgrade plan, a detailed upgrade plan, listing all the steps needed, such as taking the API down, executing database migration skip, scripts, and so on, and accounting for different kinds of scenarios, such as failure and rollback. Uh, we then had a couple of infrastructure engineers compile all these plans and execute them in a coordinated fashion. And a uh, little before that, we also got our first Horizon dashboard, which our customers, customers absolutely loved. No-brainer, right? 
So after a tedious, a fairly tedious upgrade process, we were successful and uh, we reaped the benefits of a new release. If you want to know more details on how we actually uh, did the upgrade and how we executed the plan within 10 minutes, I encourage you to attend a related talk that, uh, that's going to happen on Thursday in this very same room at 11 a.m. by our very own uh, engineers, Preeti and Gabriel. So moving on, even though the upgrade was successful, we realized that there are some hard costs involved, mostly in the form of time, time spent or misused. Firstly, there is an engineering, there's an engineer time spent on coming up with the upgrade plan itself. So if we had about seven engineers working 40 hours a week, assuming it would take a sprint to come up with the plan, which is around two weeks, that's about 560 engineering hours gone in a short time frame. You probably don't want that, just, just in case to handle uh, emergency bug fixes or inst instabilities in the cloud itself. The next cost was uh, time spent um, making our custom code changes compatible with the newer release. And we also spent significant amount of time testing. Now, we at Symantec, we believe that if you want to go to a newer version, you want to give your customers at least the same experience or a better experience. You don't want to go back on that. So we spent significant amount of time testing the user experience part, along with executing Tempest tests and manual workflow-based testing. We uh, also spent a lot of time uh, writing Puppet scripts to be compatible with the newer release, and we also updated our deployment scripts. Um, most importantly, we realized that there will be a scheduled downtime associated with your upgrade. And this can be critical if at the beginning of the year your, your, your company or your organization sets a goal, an availability goal, such as uh, for 2015, I want the availability of my cloud to be 99.999%. Well, if it's five nines, then it only allows for five minutes of downtime for the entire year. So this experience taught us a lot, and, but going forward, we decided to rethink our strategy. We, we decided that we will upgrade our backport on a per component basis only when we ne really need to. And we will be on the lookout We'll keep our eyes and ears open, whether it be through IRC, Launchpad, or attending uh, design sessions for changes in the community code that could be of immediate benefit to us. So we've come up with this flowchart that kind of summarizes our decision-making process that we have followed till date. Starting from the top left, basically we always ask ourselves, for the feature or fix that we want, is there an immediate need? If the answer is no, then we try our best to get the feature into the community code base by working with the OpenStack community. And if there is an immediate need, uh, what we do is we check if there is a solution in, in a newer version of uh, the service. If it's not there, then we, we try, we ask ourselves, can we make our change modular and portable? If we can, if we can do that, then uh, what we do is we, we are forced to make invasive changes to our uh, code base, and during upgrades, we'll have to spend a lot of time porting them. But we try to make our custom code as portable as possible, so that makes it easier to move to port between upgrades. Now, uh, going back to the second diamond out there, uh, if the solution does exist in a newer version, then we follow a completely different strategy. And we, I'll cover those paths in the following slides. So as I mentioned before, our strategy was to upgrade only when necessary and to be on the lookout for solutions and newer releases. So our, our cloud user base, user base grew pretty fast and we started onboarding complete business units onto a cloud. 
and our identity information started getting large and pretty disorganized. We had started out using the very basic dev stack model, where all the users and projects are stored under one default domain. And the users consist of both cloud users and service users. For those who don't know, service users are created per OpenStack service for token validation purposes. So the problem was, in our version of Keystone, we could only assign one identity backend. Um, and this meant storing the service users together with the corp users in, the, in one backend. And this can create problems depending on what your corporate policy is, or maybe for audit and compliance reasons. We also wanted to isolate different business units projects by keeping them in different domains. So we kept on the latest developments in the Keystone world and found a solution in one release ahead of the one we were on. In Juno, there was a completed feature called domain-specific backends. It's now called domain-specific config that allowed for separate identity backend for separate domains. So we figured this was a really neat way to organize users and business units based on, uh, by domains. The corp users could be stored uh, in one domain with an LDAP back backend, and uh, the service users could be stored in MySQL. This is exactly what we wanted, if only we had Juno. So we went back to the flowchart. There was an immediate need. We identified that a solution existed in the next release. And the change was pretty stable. And I mean this in two ways. First, it did not introduce any new bugs or instabilities within the system. Secondly, there weren't many uncompleted tasks related to this, uh, this feature uh, in Launchpad. So the next crucial thing uh, we wanted to check was, was it API compatible? And to tell you more about this, I, want, I dedicated a slide just for it. We know that OpenStack consists of a service-oriented architecture with different services talking to each other using REST APIs. So we want, to, we want to make sure that when we upgrade one specific service, that its API interface uh, worked and responded the same way as it did before, before the upgrade. In our case, it was completely possible that Keystone had abandoned the old v2.0 API in favor of the v3, and this could have left our cloud with no way to validate tokens. If you look at the gra graph here, you see who talks to who. Horizon talks to every single service without anyone talking back. And you can see Keystone is exactly the opposite. So after testing, we sure, no problem. And I recommend you to make graphs for your own systems like this, because it's really helpful for interaction testing. So we determined that you know, it's API compatible, and we went ahead and upgraded straight to Juno, which was the latest release at that time, and it was during February. Now, the problem of using the domain-specific backend feature that I just talked about was that every time we updated domain information, we had to change the Keystone config files and restart Keystone each time. Now, imagine onboarding uh, business units onto your cloud pretty frequently. And imagine doing this for a lot of data centers. It can get pretty tedious. So again, we looked at the latest developments in the Keystone world, and we found a solution. In Kilo, they added an API uh, that you could call and store domain-specific config and persist it in the database. There was no need to restart Keystone, and config could, which was stored in the database could be easily migrated between upgrades. This was exactly what we were looking for. Here's the Launchpad link for the whole domain-specific backend uh, feature, and the Garrett link is there as well. But uh, we followed, so we followed the same exact decision flow as we did for the Juno upgrade, and we went straight to Kilo, which is the latest release as of now. And then we ended up with a mix and match of different releases working just as well as before, if not better. But 
one important thing we got out of this is that this approach made us more agile, and we did save a lot on the number of engineering hours lost during an upgrade in a short time frame. Now I'm going to hand it over to Brad, who's going to talk about some really interesting Nova use cases. Thanks, Ben. So Ben has talked to you about some of the, um, the decisions that we've made as far as making upgrades and how we've decided um, what was best for us, and then some specifics on Keystone. I'm now going to take us through some specific use cases for Nova and then for Horizon, and then go, go through some of the, the lessons that we've learned along the way. For upgrading Nova, um, for anyone who's, who runs a large cloud and has been through some Nova upgrades, you probably think about upgrading Nova and go, not again, Nova. Things get so complicated as far as um, the dependencies that Nova has. It has a lot of moving parts. And in a large environment, you'll have a lot of compute nodes to upgrade, as well as your controller nodes. And when you're upgrading compute nodes, you have to be very careful not to lose your existing customers' VMs, since that's a risk when you're changing dependencies underneath what those VMs are running on top of. It's also got dependencies on Neutron and on Rabbit. And so, for example, you need to be careful about flushing Rabbit queues out as you're going through the upgrade, or otherwise you could have uh, part of the transaction um, handled with uh, one, one release of Nova, and then the, the, other sec the second half of the transaction with another release, and that can get you into a lot of trouble along the way. And so, due to the complexity of Nova, when making upgrade decisions about it, you need to take into account the, the high cost of upgrade. So a lot of planning, a lot of risk involved. And so the decision is a little bit different with Nova compared to some of the other OpenStack components. But these were some of the semantic use cases we had for Nova. And at the time we were looking at these, we were running Icehouse Nova. So we had some requirements for VM naming conventions, others for availability distribution scheduling, where we schedule VMs differently based on the project they're a part of and based on the applications those VMs run. Then we also had some requirements for what we call class of service. And so based on the class of service, that's um, in the project data, we also treat VMs differently. And finally, we had some config drive modifications to make for the way that VMs are named, uh, specifically for DNS domains. And at this point, I just wanted to get a, a show of hands looking at these use cases. And for people who have used Nova in a production environment, how many in the audience have have had to solve some of these use cases on their own. So it looks like a, a few out there. So these were our use cases, but they're also fairly common across the industry in the way you handle VMs. So when we looked at solving these use cases, we first looked at whether we could upgrade Nova to get these things. And looking into it, we actually found that Nova is very extensible in a lot of the right ways. And so you can often get what you need out of Nova without having to actually upgrade. So all of these use cases are actually supported in Icehouse and some of them before Icehouse with the, the hooks and the scheduler frameworks. And the hooks and the scheduler frameworks make it very easy to modularize uh, some of your customizations in Nova and still be able to port them between releases. And this is an, a, a technical example of using the hooks framework. So you can see that you need to modify the setup.py and tell it where your hook class is. Then define your hook class 
and then implement what it is that you want to happen with the hook when it gets invoked. And then finally, um, decorate the methods that you want to invoke the hook classes when those methods are invoked. So all of those previous features we actually implemented just from the hooks framework and the scheduler framework. So when we looked at this for Nova, we considered our use case and we again had an immediate need for a feature. It wasn't contained in the base Nova code, but through some research we did find that Nova provides this modular way of doing what we needed. And so we went through and implemented what we needed and that allowed us to uh, solve our use cases for our customers as far as VM naming and how VMs are handled, but we're still able to easily port those functions between releases. So now when we upgrade Nova later on, we'll just be using the same hooks and the scheduler modifications that we were using previously. So after those decisions about Nova, we decided to stay on Icehouse using the, the hooks and the scheduler frameworks. And as Ved mentioned, you have to be careful about API compatibility between releases. But through validation, we found that uh, Nova Icehouse would work properly with Juno Keystone and even through Kilo Keystone. So at this point in our evolution, we were running with um, Kilo Keystone um, and then Icehouse for everything else and things working properly with each other. So for the near future, we do have an upgrade. Um, we will probably upgrade to Kilo for Nova, um, mainly just due to the desire to stay closer to, to where the community is going. Um, for your own use case, you might not need that. You can fall behind further, of course, but um, uh, that's where we are at this point. And one of the later things that might also convince us to upgrade Nova further is the Gantt scheduling. So once that's ready, we'll consider upgrading for that as well. Next, I'm gonna talk about some of our Horizon use cases. And in this case, it's a study in working on trunk or even a little bit ahead of trunk. We use Keystone v3 in our environment, and Ved has already talked about domains and projects in Keystone v3. And so our users need to be able to manage membership on their domains and their projects. And in order to do that in Keystone v3, you need domain scope tokens to modify these things. Um, as of the Juno release, Horizon did not support working with domain scope tokens. And so for the Kilo release, we were working along with community, uh, making these changes to get domain scope token support into Horizon. Very important that our users are able to use Horizon since it makes it much easier than trying to use the, the CLIs for everything. So we were implementing these things in community and Kilo. Um, Unfortunately, it turned out to be a, a lot of changes and pretty complex to get it in. So it didn't make the Kilo release, but our users still needed this support. So we ended up using the unmerge changes from community and then making some stability modifications for what we needed in our environment. And also on this slide is a, a few links of what we did and how we did it for pulling the domain scope token support. And so for our decisions about Horizon in this case, again, we had an immediate need for the feature. The feature was planned to be uh, on the next, the, the next re release of Horizon into Kilo. Um, but when we got to actually needing the, the changes, we saw the changes as not stable since they weren't merged yet. And so 
we needed some custom stability modifications for our own purposes and to validate those um, in our own environment. But then with those modifications, we were able to backport then. Uh, we started out with Kilo Horizon and, and backported those changes along with uh, our own modifications. And we were able to do what our users needed just using those, uh, the, the unmerged patches from community. And that gives us what our users needed for managing projects and domains with our Keystone B3 install. So at this point, we ended up going to Kilo Horizon, but we're a little bit ahead actually also since we pulled in those domain scope token uh, patches. And as you can see here, we've now got a few different releases of things going on in our environment. And through planning and testing out things as we pulled them in, we were able to validate that everything would work properly in our environment. And so now we have a few releases running in harmony in our environment. So the next thing we have planned for the future, and this is near future for us, is upgrading Glance from Icehouse to Kilo. Um, similarly to what we're talking about with Horizon, we have some, there are unmerged changes uh, for Glance community images that we need. And so we'll, do, we'll be doing a similar thing here of uh, pulling in unmerged changes, validating them, making any stability modifications that we need, and then upgrading. So we've taken you through some of the use cases we've had and how we've made some decisions. And next I wanted to talk about some of the overall lessons we've learned here. One of the major things we've found is to isolate all your components. And this is easiest if you've got your components running in VMs or Docker or some kind of other um, easily extensible uh, where you can be very flexible about where you're running hosts. So you can see previously we had Nova, Keystone, and Glance all running on the same host, but that made it very difficult to upgrade those components uh, to different releases. When you're modifying dependencies uh, underneath those those services, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble uh, breaking dependencies between them. And so we switched to where we've got now Nova, Keystone, and Glance running in separate VMs. So this is what decouples the releases and makes it possible for you to upgrade each one separately. We've also worked with unmerged changes from community. And in this case, we found that it's, it's critical for your developers to be developing those patches that you need, no matter who is working on those changes in community. Um, and as part of that, to continuously review as well. So this not only um, makes it so that your developers understand that code before you need to pull it in, but of course it also benefits community as a whole. Not only putting fixes back that you found as those patches are being developed, but then also providing comments uh, in the reviews of those patch sets as they go on. Um, so when working on those, there's this continuous back and forth between pulling and testing the community repo changes and then testing them in your internal repo and then contributing back to community, both in patch sets and also reviews as you go along. Efficient internal CI CD also helps a lot. As these unmerged changes are being worked, there's gonna be new patch sets coming in. And so it'll be much easier for you to get some validation on whether they work properly if you can pull them into your own CI CD and automate the testing of those changes. Continuous internal testing is also very important. So again, pulling the patches as they come through. Um, even if this is just manual testing to validate they work in your environment, um, 
very helpful to keep pulling them and to follow along with the patch sets as they're being, uh, as you work them in community. Ideally, this would be automated testing, something like Tempest, where you can do some integration testing in your own environment, but even manual testing, very helpful. And then plan to sync back up with community later. So if you're making modifications for your own stability in your environment, try to keep those changes as close to community as possible so that then when the, uh, those, those patch sets do merge in community, ideally you can just upgrade to the latest community release and you have what you need automatically. And another thing we found is that we need to avoid unnecessary upgrades as much as possible. In a business environment, your use cases are what drive your need for upgrades rather than always staying with community or always having to be on the latest release. So when you're making upgrade decisions, you need to balance the, the benefit that you get from those upgrades against the cost of going through those upgrades. Often, backporting can be cheaper in the short term, but again, you have to be careful backporting that you at least want to stay close to community with what you're doing going forward so you don't stray too far in the long term. And then, this is based on your own needs, but weigh the cost of falling far behind community. So working with community releases from the past, community only supports two stable branches uh, between uh, uh, in the past. And so you need to at least have your own branches in your, in your own environment to be able to keep, uh, keep developing on a previous release and to have enough talented developers to support that previous release because um, you won't be able to go back to community if you're too far behind to pull the, uh, pull the previous release of the code. And so we've talked about how we've looked at decisions and made decisions and some of the use cases we've gone through for whether to upgrade in certain scenarios and then we've gone through some of what we've learned over time. And we found that by planning and um, validating whether we can um, upgrade to different releases, different components at different times, uh, we found that we can run with different releases uh, of the different components in the environment. And so, it's not always a case of having to be on the treadmill, but based on your use cases, you can decouple the components and then run with them and upgrade only what you need and only at the times that you need them. So with that, it's time to break the chains on these releases. Thank you. And we have some time now for questions. Uh, if you do have a question, please step up to the microphone so everybody can hear properly. Uh, hi, I had actually a uh, question about upgrading several versions at once. We had a big issue when we upgraded from uh, Grizzly to IceHouse directly. For example, some of the component database migrations didn't take unless you actually ran a version in between. And have you got any ideas how to solve these problems with your larger upgrades? Or like jumping several versions? Yeah, that's, it's an interesting problem trying to jump versions at a time. Um, we haven't actually done that in our environment yet, so every time we upgraded we at least went one release at a time. Um, I'm not familiar with a way to actually go uh, do the database migration from one release, uh, jumping two of them. Um, probably the safest thing would be just one at a time, though, at least for the database migrations. Yeah, but that, <coughs> that makes the upgrade also much more work because you actually have to start the services on an intermediate version always. Yeah, right. that's true. Yeah. 
it, also the content. Yeah. We had the same with. Yeah, we also have a new term similar issues that it. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. So, uh, is this embraced by the vendors who are providing support? For example, Red Hat or anybody that this model of upgrade is. It, so, for example, after the upgrade, there are any issues coming up. I go to my vendor. The first thing the vendor comes and says, "Okay, here's what I want you to sub." Uh, being in line, then, I, then only I can provide a support. Is this embraced by those vendors or not? I don't know of any vendors who are supporting this. Um, in our case, we run our own private cloud, and so we have our own support through our own developers um, and our own infrastructure people. Um, and so for, for our environment, we can sort of, as long as we're familiar enough with what we're doing, we can run on different levels. Uh, maybe a bit harder if you're trying to stay completely with Red Hat support or uh, uh, another vendor that would want you to be completely on one release for everything. Uh, nice, nice presentation. Um, have you, so, so certain components can be upgraded in advance of others. So like the Keystone example works pretty well. Right. Um, and I think Horizon also has a statement where they try to be backwards compatible so that you can run a newer version of Horizon against older versions of the other stuff. Um, but for those other components, Nova, Cinder, Glance, things like that, um, have you actually talked to the, those development communities to figure out if they could start publishing like backwards compatibility release notes type things like Ice or, House Nova is compatible with Keystone Kilo that type of thing um, and uh, would it be what would make that easier for you and the community to figure out what the matrix of things that are backwards or forwards compatible with each other right um, for our own environment, uh, I mentioned that we were currently working on a glance upgrade going to Kilo, and we've done some testing with that, and of course doing these things in a test environment uh, beforehand to validate the APIs that you need work in your environment with the different releases that you have. Um, I don't know of any efforts that are going on in community to have like a, a matrix of uh, which releases work with each one. That really goes back to the API compatibility of um, uh, which, which releases can be spread across. Um, for for but, instance, if you were to use uh, uh, some specific features in newer versions of things like Kilo for, uh, for net tokens or something like that, would Nova Icehouse support for net tokens or would you have to upgrade the uh, the Keystone middleware auth token stuff that, that's in Nova to then be a Kilo version of that, so now you have a hybrid of everything. Right, yeah, and that's something that's based on your own use case of what you need from each service, and are the APIs for those use cases compatible between releases? Uh, very good talk. Um, quick, quick question, you discuss API compatibility testing. Can you give more details on that? Is that mainly Tempest-based, or how did you test that the different versions of Horizon was possible? Would be would be best to automate the testing. In our environment, we, we did it in a, a dev test environment. So we have uh, very similar to what we have in production. And then we're able to install into that environment and kind of play around with things. So. And again, that goes back to what your use cases are. So your customers may not need certain functions from Keystone or Glance, but based on exactly what you need, those are the things that would have to be validated to work together. Right, we also incorporated workflow testing, and that, that's like um, we test Nova through Horizon. So we make sure that whatever comp component we're upgrading, we test it through other services. So that kind of ensures that they work as they did before. That makes sense. 
so in relation to the previous question about the Nova, actually I heard in Paris that actually they're going to support like a one version back compatibility. And uh, even for the upgrade time, actually you can have like a mixed version of the compute. So Nova might be newer and the compute might be still the older one. And that should work just for the upgrade time. So this is supported, okay? That, that's what, was, what I heard in Paris. Uh, but my question is actually about, uh, you mentioned something about the model that you actually have a service, OpenStack services running inside the VMs, right? So uh, do you, for example, doing this like a kind of in-place upgrade or you just basically just like, I don't know, uh, creating the new VM, installing the new version of the OpenStack, throwing away the old one? Actually, yeah. that's, a, that's a very good question for a related talk that's happening on Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. But right. go ahead. Right. Um, because we we exactly doing. looking in this direction, right? We we don't really right. care about the the old version. Right. We just basically create another version, install the OpenStack service, whatever it is. Uh, just shutting down the old. I mean, just switching the HE proxy to this new version of the VM, and then we can keep the old version. And this gives us really easy rollback in the any in case of any problems. And yeah. the storage is cheap, so we can keep it for I don't know half a year or a year. Nobody cares. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the easy ways to make sure uh, that things work properly. Um, again, that uh, the talk on Thursday will get more into the specifics on that. Okay, okay. I'll probably pop up on this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any further questions, just uh, talk to the presenters outside. Thank you.